The first priority of an automotive chassis suspension system is stability and control. You didn't bring a pen today. What if I don't have one? What would you do then? Yeah. All right. There you go. Don't show up ever without a pen. Bad news, man. Okay. When the vehicle is traveling on a straight and level road, the tire contact must. They gotta. They gotta be relatively equal. Everything's gotta be. In other words, you don't want the tire patches. Some of them pulling one way or another. Not you know. And basically, all of the wheel. What's the first thing you're supposed to do when you're doing an alignment? By the way. If you're going to do an alignment on a car after you've already done a, you know, walked around it, and made sure that the, you know, the ain't no blown out tires or anything. What do you got to do? First thing you do, you set, check the air pressure in the tires. I mean, if you don't check the air pressure in the tires, you ain't doing a good alignment. This is all there's to it. And uh, if you've got, and, uh, and how many of you know that a tire can pull? I mean, a car can pull one way or another because of bad tires. That one yesterday that she was talking about. If it's got bad tires on it. A lot of times you can, if you know the alignment's right, but it's still pulling and the tire pressures are right, you swap the front tires from one side to the other. If it pulls the other way, you know it's tires. Hey, Abby, have a seat. You, uh, let's see, you got to get a, you got to get, I don't, I think I was one packet of stuff short, so I'm going to print you, let me print you that, uh, this front page right here. Sit down over there somewhere. We're just starting. We're just starting. Okay. I'm going to print that. Right there. Coming out of there. All right. Now, what I'm saying today is what that's, uh, that's basically we're starting out in our steering and suspension. And I just started uh, about two and a half minutes ago. And so basically, uh, how many of you guys have ever driven a vehicle that was out of line? And what does it feel like? What did it feel like to you when you were driving a vehicle that was out of line? And it, the alignment was out of line. It was pulling one way or another, or, you, or it was basically the steering was loose, or it wandered all over the road, and it's just all kinds of stuff. And it wears you out. I have a question. Yeah. I, I drove a car, and I know it was out of line, but like, I guess, would the steering column also be affiliated with it as well? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it can be. It depends on what's going on. Because work, like, you do this right here, you, you're still going straight. Yeah. You're still moving, and then all of a sudden, now you're moving. Yeah. I well, that can either be in the steering gear, or it could be in the coupler, you know, the... Like years ago, they used to have a little uh, flexible coupler that was connected between the steering column and the gear, and it was it kind of acted like a U joint. Uh, but then they started actually putting U joints in there, and so yeah, if there's slack, if there's slack in that little connection, because the steering column goes straight, then it's got to make a curve typically. Years ago, they made them where they went straight down to it, but they still had that little flexible coupling. If that's messed up. You're going to turn it a ways before it responds. But that can be in the steering box or steering gear. The steering gear can be loose moving around under the car. There's a bunch of things that can cause that. But, uh, yeah, but it's easy to tell. You know what, what we call a dry park check is whenever you get under the car and you look at everything. You need something? You, you're looking. Huh? Need a pen. Somebody give her a pen. She doesn't know about the rule that I made about having to have a pen. Willie is loaded with pens. You know, Look at Willie. Yeah. <laughs> you what? Look at that. There, she's got yeah, one. I, I, like I saw her looking around over, and I knew she needed something. Like a businessman on a go. You take it, girl. All right, that's no problem. Okay, that's the. That's my hard and fast rule for everybody. Always have a pen when you come because you're going to be writing something. Okay, now we're going to have. Uh, so stability and control are compromised on a wet service or a long trip. Like if you're driving around and you got one that's out of line, it's just not as safe to drive as the other way. And that's just, it's, yeah, it's almost as old as a wheel. You know, you're going to know this if you've ever driven anything. Uh, but the tools and the information available for wheel alignment have changed dramatically over the last 10 years. And no matter what alignment system you're using or how good you are at using it, understanding the basic concepts, uh, or make it easier to uh, achieve a perfect four-wheel alignment. Because just about all cars nowadays are four-wheel alignment. Now, on the Ranger or uh, the GMC, uh, you know, you're only, there's only a very limited amount of things you can do to align the rear on those. If the rear axle is crooked under the truck, yeah, or if it's bent, you may have a problem. But you can't fix it without replacing the rear axle if the axle's bent under one that's got a, you know, solid axle under the back of it. Okay, so we're going to start with a definition of terms. Viewed from above the vehicle, the geometric center line is an imaginary line drawn from the center of the rear axle to the center of the front axle. You got that? Geometric. Geometric center line. Center line? Hey, bro. What's up with your bad self and everything? Hey, I'm short a pair of pants. Okay. But I need to, I've been I'm running shy on that. My goodness. $82.48.
Yep. Wow. Okay. I need to get that paid up. So you were here that one week and. Yeah. And since I wasn't wearing my uniforms, I went ahead and paid for them anyway. Give me a, a look in that Taurus out there, old man, so to keep me from having to leave my desk. And you're going to see a brown checkbook in there. Bring me that brown checkbook and I'll pay you. Okay. All right. So basically, that's the line drawn from the center of the rear axle to the center of the front axle. And that follows the center line of the vehicle itself from the halfway point between the rear wheels to the halfway point between the front wheels. So you're halfway between the front wheels, halfway between the rear wheel, and you're drawing a line straight down the middle of the car. You got it? Is everybody clear on that? Not complicated, okay? We're going to, and, and there, okay, now the thrust line describes the actual direction the rear wheels steer the car. Uh, if, it, if the thrust line is pointing right or left, you know, it's going to push it in that direction. And that's the real world direction the rear wheels are aimed, irrelevant of the geometric center line. You understand what I'm saying? How many of you guys have noticed on, I don't know if you play some video games or some of you, some of these jets, uh, you're going to have on a, in a fighter plane, you've got a little circle and you've got a little X on your heads-up display. And one of those is the direction you're flying, and the other one is the direction the nose is pointed. And they're not always together. That might be pointing, you know, the nose can be pointing this way while it's flying like that and all that. And um, This is a trustworthy guy. And he went and got my checkbook and he didn't even tear a check out of it. Show me that. Okay. Ha! <laughs> He's a good guy. Unit first. Yeah, I don't know what happened to that pair of pants unless, you know, but they just, I can't, I'm running, I'm running short of set and I have, you know, I've got all of those that you got out there plus the ones I'm wearing and I think I may have two more pair on, maybe three, whatever. Anyway, do the math, but I'm a short one. I don't usually get this thing. Yeah, I usually pay every four weeks and so I'm not. Forty-eight, and and go ahead and take that. And if you're, if, if I could trouble you to put this back where you got it, I'll you know appreciate that too. Not a problem. And then lay that on my desk in here. And we'll take that. Okay, you already got that. So if I ask you guys, if I have you have a verbal exam, and I ask you about the geometric center line and the thrust line, you know what I'm talking about, wouldn't you? Now, about from above. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> on top of the car. And if you're, yeah, if you're driving, I was driving my pickup one day. And I, see if you can figure out what happened here. I had a 74 Ford pickup truck. And I'm driving my pickup, and all of a sudden, uh, my rear wheels went through, uh, and I don't remember how it happened, but I hit something with the rear wheel. Bam, real hard. And all of a sudden, my steering wheel goes from like this to like that. And I didn't even hit it with the front wheels. You went airborne. Nope. I mean, it, I mean, I probably would have felt better if I were airborne because it was rough. But now all of a sudden my steering wheel's turned sideways. I mean, it was like this, and now my, you know, the bar across the center wheel is turned like that, and I have to drive like that. And if somebody comes up behind me, here I am going down the road like a dog track. Have you been behind a vehicle like that, this dog tracking? Yeah. You know, and you say, what in the world is that about? You know, how would I fix that? Actually, what happened was, no, no, it wasn't a steering thing. It was a thrust line thing because when I hit that thing. It sheared, you know, you got the, in these leaf springs, you know, that are stacked under there, you know, that are hooked here and your axles under there and all that. There's a tie bolt that, hold, that bolts all of those together and keeps them together. And when I hit that, it sheared that tie bolt and the axle literally moved under the truck about three inches. Now, if it moves far enough, the drive shaft falls out. And if, and if it's turning when it falls out, it, well, bam, 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 it's hitting there, it didn't come out. But my rear axle was under the truck, and I was dog tracking, and I had to actually jack the truck up and take the weight off of that, you know, and put two, uh, put a new tie. You'll see how that works. But, well, if under the, you look at it under the Ranger, you know, you got to pull the leaf spring out, and you got to put a new, new tie bolt in it, put it all back together. And, and it's not that hard to do, but it surprised me. I didn't expect that, you know. Is that one of those jobs you do it every 100,000 miles? No, you don't have to ever do it if you're, unless you hit a pothole and shear your tie bolt. And I'll tell you something else that happened, too. The reason that happened was when I got that truck, somebody had put an extra set of load levelers on it, some extra leafs under it, and that son of a gun would rode like a, hard like a brick. I mean, it stood up. He had had a welding machine in the back of it or something. I didn't like it bouncing me around so bad. So when I took it apart and I put it back together, I just put regular bolts in there. I didn't put a regular a tie bolt. I put a bolt that would work, that was the right size, and it wasn't. It didn't have enough shearing. You know, it didn't resist the shearing of that of those springs enough, and that's why it happened. It was basically my fault. 
I mean, I didn't expect it, you know, to hit these things like that. A tie bolt's harder than the bolt I was using, so you don't usually have that problem. But anyway, this illustrates what we're trying to talk about. Okay, now the thrust line is a line that divides the left and right rear wheel toe. Okay, now I'm going to, you know, get you, there's a pictures on your test too that were, that kind of illustrate these lines. The thrust angle is the angle formed by comparing the chassis geometric center line to the rear uh, wheel thrust line. Got it? That's the thrust angle. All right. So, let's see. Uh, that angle is measured in degrees. A right aimed thrust angle that deviates from the center line is referred to as positive, and a left aimed thrust angle is negative. You got me? Right, if it's aimed to the right, is positive if it's aimed to the left. All right. Okay, center line steering refers to a level steering wheel position when the vehicle's traveling straight ahead. You got me? A non-centered steering wheel is an indication of a probable thrust angle problem. Remember when I told you my truck, my, it was sideways because my thrust angle was wrong because my axle got crooked under the truck and all that? Okay, the desired result, regardless of what type of vehicle is involved or what alignment approach is used, it's always the same. You want to create a parallel direction of travel for the front and rear wheels when the vehicle travels in a straight line. You basically want the front wheels and the rear wheels tracking when you're going straight. Basically, that's how that works. In order to achieve that, there's three types of alignment procedures. Now, you've got a two-wheel center line alignment. Okay, now your geometric center line alignment involves aligning only the two front steer wheels. Using a vehicle's geometric center line is the only reference. In the olden days, you would see them doing alignment. They would just put the two heads on the front, and they would align it that way. Got me? Now, you know there's, there's there, you know what the alignment angles are. There's caster, camber, and toe. Everybody know what those are, right? Okay, caster has got to do with the steering axis. Okay, camber has got to do with the inward or outward tilt of the, of the, of the tires. Right? Like that. Mm -hmm. Positive, negative. Positive, negative. All right, that's looking at from the front. Positive, negative. This is pretty important. Okay, now the uh, toe is going to be in and out. And as I remember, out is positive and in is negative, you know. But I always call that toe in and toe out. You know what I'm saying? All right, now, uh, and Daniel was reading in some of these, uh, you know, textbooks that they sent me to evaluate and all that thing. And uh, Daniel had talked about how whenever you're, uh, you're, you're basically the way the front end of the line as far as toe goes on a vehicle that's rear wheel drive, you're basically going to have it towed in just slightly because when you're pushing it down the road, it's going to try to tow out a little bit. Right? You got me? Now, the rear wheels are pushing, it's going to tow out. If you've got front wheel drive, you're going to tow them out a little bit because it's going to be pulling in because the, those wheels are the ones that are pulling. You see? And you're basically also going to align it so it's going to try to climb up the road crown a little bit. Because, you know, the crown of the road is like this most of the time. And if you're in a situation where you're driving, it's, it wants to fall away from that crown because it's a slope. You know, they, they make the roads like that so water will rain off of them. And so your car's got to be lined so that it'll pretty, in the, when you're in the right lane, it's going to stay there. Now, you're, you're going to feel a car, if you've got a fairly strong road crown, it's designed to ride on the right lane. If you go to the left lane, it may try to fall away from the crown just because of the nature of the road. See, so that doesn't mean you've got an alignment problem necessarily. You got me? So just keep, aware, keep that in mind. Okay. Now, anybody confused about any of this at all? Talk to me if you are. I'm yeah. kind of colorblind right now because it's five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that those copies don't have colors, and I'll have to get with you on that. Okay, thank God. Yeah. All right. So now then, whenever you um, let's see, uh, if you only revert to the ge geometric center line, you're not considering the thrust angle of the rear wheels at all, and that's a mistake. So if you're just doing the front, you're not going to really do a good alignment if the thrust angle is out. See what I'm saying? Okay. So the thrust condition always causes the front wheels to steer in the direction of the thrust line. And so whatever the thrust line is, you're going to have to steer that way to, to track that, see. Uh, if the front wheels are adjusted parallel to the center line instead of the thrust line, constant steering input by the driver may be needed. Premature tire rear wear, you know, and the directional control will be decreased. Now, if you guys bear with me on this, as we get deeper into this, it will burn in a little more. You know what I'm saying? If you don't understand it all the very first time you hear it, that doesn't mean that you're dumb or anything. It just means that you haven't soaked it up yet. Got me? But uh, the I fact, like but I really appreciate it if you don't understand it, if you let me know. I don't like to say where the deer in the headlights look like, and you're like, 
you know, I don't understand that, but I'm not going to be the one to speak up. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and I, I had that instructor, it was a female instructor, her name was Ellen Smith at General Motors Training Center in Houston, Texas in 1981. And uh, there was 12 mechanics in there, and she had intimidated every one of them. Not on purpose, but they were scared to say anything because if it was wrong, they'd feel like a fool because she was a female instructor, right? And so they would say, she said, you know, she would ask a question that any mechanic ought to know the answer to, and nobody would answer it because they was afraid it would be wrong, you know, because they'd afraid that whatever they knew wasn't exactly right, you know. But anyway, it's, it's kind of funny to watch that kind of thing happen. Okay, uh, the, let's see, the center of the rear axle, the halfway point between the two rear wheels, can be located with total disregard for the rear axle design. Got me? Okay, the rear axle can be offset from the center or it can be crooked, causing the rear wheels to point right or left. When you only consider the geometric center line as the point of reference in the front wheel alignment, you're assuming the rear axle is located where it's supposed to be. Okay, now don't get, no, don't bog down on this, but I mean, this is basically some foundational stuff. The two wheel geometric center line alignment can't be accurate if that axle is not straight. That's the point. Okay, thrust line alignment considers the actual location and direction of the rear wheels. Uh, and you don't ever assume the thrust line is parallel to the geometric center line. You always got to check that. Now your good front end machines will check that. If you've got the heads hanging on the back and you've got the heads hanging on the front, it's going to tell you about your thrust line. And that's on our screen back there. That computer back there is pretty dadgum smart. Now let me say this, pause for a second to say that when you're doing an alignment on that machine back there, and everybody in here I hope gets to do several of them, uh, pull the doors down because those cameras on those heads get confused by light. If you got the doors up and there's a lot of light outside, you're going to get all kind of screwed up angles. That's why I got some of the windows blacked out over there and I got some of them tinted. When you pull them doors down, you know, after you get the car in there, get the doors down so you won't get messed up angles and all that. Okay, because the computer is basically going to look at those angles and it's going to, believe it or not, it'll give you alignment, adjustment, help, and all kinds of cool stuff. You know, it's a fairly nice machine. Okay, so... Uh, when you're adjusting the direction of the front wheels, that'll be set parallel to the steered direction of the rear wheels defined by the actual thrust line. You, know, you can parse that. When aligning the front wheels on a vehicle that offers no rear wheel adjustment, setting the front wheels according to the thrust line is the only accurate method, method of doing front wheel alignment. So you're going to have to mount all four anyway. Got me? The thrust line may not be parallel to the vehicle body, but at least you can make the front wheels parallel to the direction of travel, and that's the most important job. Uh, you're going to be doing the best you can, you know, basically, if, basically if you got rear axle is bent or something, you're going to have issues, but that don't happen a lot. Total four-wheel alignment is possible on a vehicle that features front and rear-wheel alignment adjustments. Now, a lot of them will let you adjust rear toe, rear camber. Now, caster is not anything that you're going to have on the rear wheels, typically. Caster has got to do, and I never really got, it, got into that a minute ago, but caster has got to do with your steering axis. Now, the steering axis... These, these, uh, the steering axes, A-X-E-S, isn't that the plural for axis, is, is tilted in like this, right? And why would you tilt them in like that, you think? It's basically going to make it more stable. You know, when a table that's got the legs like that is more stable than one that's got the legs like that. Mm -hmm. and so you don't want to, you know, turn. So they're going to tilt them in like that. In addition to being tilted in when seen from the front, they're also tilted like this. You got me? The steering axis, that's the axis on which the wheels turn when you turn your wheels, is actually going to be, and if you've got that, that thing set up right, when you turn the wheels, it's actually going to pick the car up a little bit when you turn it. And then when you turn it back to the center, it's going to go to the low point, and then you go back to the other side, it's going to pick it up again. And that's why your tire, that's why your car wants to go straight down the road when you let off the wheel, more or less, it's going to go straight down the road. Now, if you've got one that you turn the wheels and they kind of stay there, and it's, you know you can have tight steering parts and that can make it do that. But if you've got one that the steering parts are loose and it just wants to go every which way, you know, positive caster would be, you know, with that top tilted back and the you know steering axis tilted forward. You'll get to under, where you understand it's better over there. Think about a caster, you know, on a, a shopping cart, right? All right, if I've got one of them casters that just turns around and around and around, you know, that you can roll, all right, and I'm rolling it, holding the little stem, you know, if I'm just holding it straight up, it's going to whirl around and do all kind of crazy stuff in it. But what if I tilt that stem back and I push it that way? Yeah, it's going to be real stable, isn't it? That's the, that, think about that. See, it's just real simple. You're talking about wheels 
<laughs> and those, like a shopping cart, you know. Don't you love pushing a shopping cart where the wheel's doing this all over the place all the time? I just despise that. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, it seems like it always comes my way. Okay, now then. Uh, so you're still going to need, though, even if you can't adjust the rear wheels, you're still going to need another rear wheel thrust angle to get the correct front wheel alignment. And, and in front wheel alignment job, the front wheels are aligned along two parallel lines extending from the forward to the rear wheels. But if the thrust line is not the same as the center line uh, of the vehicle, the rear wheels will not want to travel along those parallel lines. You're going to have tracks in the, in the sand where you got the tires tracking like that. You know, okay? okay, so a non-zero thrust angle can create a number of problems. Dog track in, which we talked about, looks crooked while it's traveling. Thrust angle that's out of zero can affect the turning angles of the front wheels and cause uh, uh, toe, camber, and caster related handling problem in the tire wear. And how many of you know what toot is in regard to front end alignment geometry? Toot. What is that? No idea. Toe out on turns. It's an acronym. <laughs> yeah. Toe out on turns. And why does it need a toe out on turns? Because the inside wheel is making a tighter circle. Mm, Got me? Yeah. So they're going to have to toe out a little bit whenever you turn. And it's got to work both ways. I tell you what, if you ever get a bunch of links and threaded rods and stuff and try to build the geometry for the, a go-kart or something, that is a heck of a lot more complicated than you think. <laughs> I mean, but the, the people that have built this stuff, you know, have done it so long, they know exactly how to make it work. But that's the toe out on turns is something that's going to come up later on. Okay. Okay, as the driver continually applies steering input to compensate for the bad thrust line, the front wheels are not in the same steering position as they were during the alignment job, and so on and so forth. Now the wheels are turned, caster and camera angles of each wheel start to change. Because, you know, you, it, let me tell you this. You cannot measure caster without turning the wheels back and forth. You've got to turn the wheels back and forth. That's called a caster sweep on our machine back there. And when you're doing a caster adjustment, it's not typically a live adjustment. You've got to make a caster adjustment and then do another caster sweep. And, you know, if you're somebody that's sort of impatient like me, you don't really like having to go back and do that, but you got to in order to make it work right. Um, okay. All right. So now then, to drive straight ahead with uneven side-to-side -side tow camber and caster is going to make premature tire wear, steering, you know, parts are going to wear out, and the driver is going to be nervous, and a non-zero thrust angle causes front wheels to be steered parallel to the rear and so on and so forth. And we can go on that. Uh, so just remember, never perform a front wheel alignment without having the back, you know, the heads hung on the back on that machine. Won't let you do it anyway. But in the early days, they'd let you do that. In a perfect world, you can set the rear thrust angle to zero and make it parallel, and the result is it travels in a straight line with minimal driver input. People, it's, it's left to go down the road. See, some of these vans, these big Ford vans and all that kind of stuff, when they get some miles on them, uh, they will out there, they get to where they don't drive good, and it's really hard to get those things lined up where they will drive like they're supposed to. If you've got a big uh, one-ton van or something and you have mismatched tires on it, that will cause it to not drive right, you know, and that kind of thing. And it seems like everybody's as happy with the van and they don't have a bit of a problem with it. And, and uh, well, like we had one of these, and all of a sudden it was, uh, you know, bam, this thing's not driving good. It's oversteering. We don't like the way it is. And you can fight with it and, you know, fool with the steering box and all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, I've known of these, some of these front end shops working like it all day long trying to get one of them vans straightened out. Most alignments are fairly straightforward. Most of the time when they're doing alignments, they don't do anything except tow anyway. They measure all the angles, they set tow. And that's what your 2995 special is. You get me? Mm -hmm. All right, so, okay. Uh, all right, let me see here. You got to make sure that you do the same route on all of your chassis test drives. Got that? Use the same route on all of your chassis. T Whenever you're doing chest test drives, try to use the same route so you'll know what one's supposed to feel like. If you're on strange territory, it's going to feel different this time than it did last time. And you're going to actually get, what you're, what you're looking for is a benchmark, right? A baseline. This is what, you know, if you get used to the way, and every car drives a little different, but if you're always on that same course, it ought to include a number of road conditions. It can affect steering and vehicle control. A relatively flat straight section to check for pull, wander, and steering wheel position. Steering wheel position meaning is it centered? You know, when you're doing the tow, you're gonna center that steering wheel and lock it in place and make sure nothing's bound up. And one of the most irritating things for a guy that's uh, is working with, well, somebody that's getting their front end of line, is when they get the thing back and the steering wheel's a little crooked. That just drives people crazy, and it ain't professional. So when you get ready to get before you unhang your sensors, what you're gonna do is watch the screen, turn your wheels back and forth, 
and then get it where the screen says it and the thing's in the center, and you're going to make sure that steering wheel is still centered. Because if you've got all of your alignments and everything's perfect, and you can have it where it's not going to wear any tires or anything, and you can back it off the lift. If the steering wheel's crooked, then you're not done. You've got to put it back on the lift and fix that. Can't give it back to the customer with a crooked steering wheel because they're not going to accept that. And they don't really care about your whining. You know, put it back on there. Now, crazy Dodge pickups. Some of them Dodge pickups, you couldn't make the, you couldn't make all of enough. What am I trying to say? You couldn't align it so that the wheel was centered because of the way the steering wheel. I mean, it's done like on the, like a '91 Dodge four-wheel drive Ram. And so what they designed for you to do was line it up and then pull the steering wheel off and put it on the <laughs> kind of straight because it's got splines. Yeah, with a um, 93 Silverado. Yeah, so if you pull it off and put it on there the right way, you know. Anyway, uh, so you got to have a stop-start area to check for brake and pull, steer, torque steer, and shock compression and recovery. You know what torque steer is? Whenever you take off, you got a short CV axle on one side, a long CV axle on the other side. One of them will twist more than the other, and it's going to pull in the direction of the long axle. And that could be either way. On a Honda car, the engine's in there backwards. And also they're on a Mitsubishi. And if those, uh, you know, torque, if, if you got a long CV axle on one side, a short one on the other side, you remember, and when you take off, it's liable to pull one way and then straighten back up. That's because of the CV axle. has got nothing to do with the alignment, right? Something else that affects alignment, a lot of people don't ever think about, like on Abby's car, when we change out the transmission, which is probably going to happen, if you pull the, uh, that H-frame out from under there, you get the transmission out. If you don't, if you put it back under there, since so many of the steering parts are connected to that, your alignment can be out of whack on that because you didn't put that H frame back exactly where it was. So that's something that's got to be determined too. Now let's say you put a transmission and you pull it back in. They come out. Hey, my alignment's all messed up now. It ain't their fault because you're the one that pulled the H frame out and put it back. Got me. So that's part of the deal too. Uh, okay, uh, a dip and a bump. It needs to be on your thing. Remember, you got to have a relatively flat straight section to check for pull, wander, steer, and wheel position. A start-stop area to check for brake and pull, torque steer, and shock compression and recovery. And a dip and a bump to check for bump steer, bottoming, and vehicle stability. You know, sometimes when you hit a bump, it tries to go, you know. Uh, a right turn and a left turn to check for steer and return and body sway. You know, body sway is what's supposed to be, you know, supposed to be uh, neutralized by your sway bar and all that. Uh, one time, eons ago, my dad had a, you know, he had a Volkswagen shop, and I actually put, uh, had a, he had a 60, no, a 58 Volkswagen that I got from him. That was the first year they made the big window in the back, and I got that thing from him. I mean, we, you know, he had it, and we just stabbed an engine in that thing. The first time I drove it down the road, it just drove like it was about to turn over every time he turned the wheel. And I came back, and I said, why did this thing drive so bad? My dad says, those cars didn't have a sway bar under the front of them. I said, really? I mean, it was horrible. It was just, you couldn't hardly stand to drive it. And I said, well, what do we do about that? And he said, I'd take the axle off that 64 model down there and put it under it. So I did that, and it drove like a Porsche. <laughs> I mean, if you drive one without a sway bar under it, it really gets your attention about what, you know, you see that sway bar, and it just looks like something silly that's in the way, you know, but boy, is that thing ever important. Yeah? That you just went over, was that the optimum test drive? Yes. I mean, every, every test drive that you take should actually include a flat position, a stop-start area, a dip and a bump, and a right turn and left turn. Got it? Okay, uh, the tires can have a major impact on drivability and controllability too. If the tires are mismatched, it will never handle like it's supposed to. It's worse on some vehicles than others, though some of them you don't notice a lot much. Even with perfect wheel alignment, they'll have handling problems. It'll be blamed on the work instead of the, uh, you know, customer selecting their own tires. Now, we don't lack much, guys. We're, we're going to be through here pretty quick. Okay, check them close, guys. Check the tires close, right? It's real important. Uh, if the brands differ from wheel to wheel, bring that to their attention. Say, look, you got a, you know, you got one brand over here, you got a Michelin over here, you got a Dayton over there, you, you know. Back there. Yeah, and people don't really want to hear that. They feel like, well, if the tire looks okay, why can't we just go ahead and keep driving that? But uh, even if two tire uh, models may be produced by the same tire maker, the model designs can provide vastly different riding handling characteristics. If you got them different, I'm gonna tell you something. There's this lady one time uh, that I knew that bought a car that belonged to our company. And there was a guy named Paul, don't remember, his last name started with an F, but he drove that car, and he actually had another car like it at home. It was a Plymouth Valari, and he took two of the tires off of his car and put them on that car, and two of the tires off that car and put them on his. All right, and so what we didn't realize, he had done it, you know. I mean, I was responsible for keeping the cars up. Well, they sold the car to a little old lady with, you know, blonde hair and glasses that worked in the office, and so she was driving that thing downtown, 
and she hit the brakes, and uh, it just crossed up in traffic and got hit by three or four other cars. It didn't hurt her, but it ripped that car all the shreds. And I said, go look at that car and see if you can figure out why that why she crashed like that. Well, I walked around that car where it was all tore up, and it had, uh, and this was back in the days where some cars had bias ply tires and some had radials. You remember the old tires that weren't radials? All right, so that Paul Farron guy, that was his name, Farron, he had put left front and right rear tires were bias ply, and the right front and left rear were radials. I got a few minutes here. Okay, now then, we're going to go, let's see, where were we at? You know, a diagonal white pattern does exist, you know, on them. you got to replace the tire since the wear pattern is going to continue. Let me ask you this. You're not going to be able to put the rubber back that's already worn off, are you? <laughs> so you can still go, you can get your alignment done, but your tire is still mostly worn out, almost down to the cords. And so even if your alignment's right now, all the rubber that's already gone is still going to be gone. Got me? All right, what if you got real thin tread in the middle, but good tread on the outside? So what does that mean? I mean, your tire is inflated too high. Get too much air pressure in it, like somebody used that number he was talking about to air the tires up. <laughs> okay, if you got tire that's got good tread on the inside, but it's on the outside edges it's worn out, what does that mean? It means uh, it was a low tire. Underinflated, yeah, they've been driving it low like that. Yeah. My wife had that happen on her car back when she was single and she wasn't ever checking her tire pressures, and she wore out a tire and had to buy a tire because of that. And now she drives me crazy when her tire pressure is checked all the time. But, you know, if you put nitrogen in tires, which is hard to do because you got to pull all the air out of them and put the nitrogen in them, that nitrogen doesn't change pressure with temperature. The tires don't go low. And furthermore, the people at NASCAR use it in their impact guns. they got big tanks of nitrogen out there. What are you smiling about, Webb? Huh? Nitrogen. I mean, because they took all the air out of mine and put nitrogen in all my cars. Yeah. And, it, and when you go low on it, how can you can you still put air? You, if you do, then you've uh, well, yeah, you've shot that whole thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you put any air in it when it's got nitrogen in it, then that whole nitrogen thing is done is shot. <laughs> it, it makes it kind of roar too. Yeah, it's a little different, you know. But uh, yeah. Yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. That well, yeah, the GM dealers will all. I mean, they have a, a f service where they do that. Uh, the dealer does it too. Yeah. So. But anyway, uh, okay, with the right tools, the latest specs, and the knowledge that comes from training and experience, which is what you're hopefully going to get some in here this semester, you can make the numbers on the alignment machine come out right. Now, let me say this, and I want you all, everybody in here to remember it. It's really important. The car is always going to pull toward the tire that has the most positive camber and the most negative caster. If you've got everything in the green on that machine, but you're on the edge of positive camber and the edge of negative caster, it's going to pull in that direction anyway. Let's say you got brand new tires on it. You know, and that hunter man, the guy that was doing the, the hunter uh, engineering guy that would come and work on the front end machine, he said the hardest thing that he ever had to teach anybody, they felt like if everything's in the green, it ought not to be pulling. And when he would look at the car they were talking about, it would have camber that was in the green but slightly positive, which if the tire is leaning to the right, it's going to pull that way. You know, like if I lean this tire to the right and roll, it's going to go off in that direction, right? And think of it that way. And the negative uh, caster is actually going to make it pull in that direction too. So both of those elements of the alignment can make it pull in the direction of that particular tire. You got me? All right. All right. When uh, when they take their hands off the wheel and, and watch it go straight, you're going to be getting more alignment business from their buddies, right? Okay, now here's some angle tips right here. If the rear wheels are not adjustable, establish the rear axle thrust line. Find that out what that is anyway, and align the front wheels according to that direction the rear wheel travel. If the rear wheels are adjustable, adjust the individual rear toe to create a zero thrust angle, and inline and parallel to the geometric center line, and left and right camber should not differ by more than a half a degree. You got me? How many degrees are there in the circle? 360, 360 degrees, so half a degree. Left and right camber should not differ by more than half a degree. That applies to both the front and the rear axles. Now, sometimes it's hard. On the rear axle, sometimes you got to buy shims and stuff that, you know, are for the hubs and all that kind of stuff. But, I mean, if you're really serious about the alignment, we, you, know, you got to do that. Okay. Now, uh, left and right caster really shouldn't vary in more than half a degree either. Get right down to it. And caster is a little harder to adjust in some cases. Don't assume the front toe on a front wheel drive vehicle should always be set negative, or that's out. Out's negative, actually. Uh, or that the front toe on a rear wheel drive vehicle should be set positive. Uh, sometimes 
that, that Daniel's, you know, what you had read in there, sometimes that's not so. Your OE, that machine's going to, you're going to select a vehicle, that machine's going to tell you where it's supposed to be. You got me? I mean, because you're going to select, this is a 2002 Silverado, you know, blah, 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 four-wheel drive, whatever, and then it's going to actually know what those numbers are because they're loaded in the machine's memory. So you don't really have to go, you can look up those numbers on all data if you want to, but the machine's already got them. And also, all data is available on that machine back there, too. So if you're right there and you just want to, you know, minimize the program that's on the machine and pull all that up, you can do that, too, which is pretty cool, you know. All right, because um, that's just a Dell computer that's hooked up to, you know, with some special inputs. All right, so now don't assume a, gener a generic spec will work on all vehicles. Always check service bulletins for the latest specs. You got me? All right, so both thrust line and thrust angle are measured. You can use a four-wheel alignment system that way. Uh, individual rear toe and total rear toe is going to make these calculations for us, and you know, I already talked about that. Okay, is there any questions that you guys are bo are bogged down on in your test? You got all, if you got the answers to all of them. Which what what do you lack? Okay, all right now uh, let me see. Question number five is the green line's the one in the middle, guys. The green line's the one in the middle. The red line's the one that's pointing off to the side. Got me? That helped you with that, didn't it? Yeah. Okay. And number seven. Okay. If your thrust angle is pointing off to the left, in other words, the red line, the one that's pointing off from the center, that's negative. If it's dead in the middle, that's zero. And if it's to the right, that is positive thrust angle. You got me? Negatives to the left, positives to the right, and zero is right in the middle. Everybody familiar with that? And we are through in about 45 minutes today. Now, everybody knows what your marching orders are. Whatever you didn't finish yesterday, you need to try to finish today. And, um, you know, you got some more sheets, you know, in your steering and suspension part of it. You make it happen. And uh, any more questions?